Hello, my name is Ohad Amon, and I will be presenting the paper, Three Thread Generation Attacks on the Format Preserving Encryption FF3. This paper was made by myself, Or Dunkelman, Nathan Keller, Eyal Ronan, and Odishami. Let's begin by defining FF3. FF3 is a format preserving encryption specified by NIST in 2016. Format preserving encryption can encrypt any domain into itself, unlike most block ciphers, which can only handle uh, a specific uh, predetermined domain. For example, we can encrypt credit card numbers such that each, each ciphertext is also a conforming credit card number. This is useful mainly for adding encryption to existing databases or communication packets that require a specific format, uh, where the ciphertext cannot, uh, cannot be of a different format than the plaintext. After FF3 was proven insecure by recent attacks by Dirac and Vaudenay in 2017, a new cipher, FF3.1, was published that fixes the uncovered uh, vulnerabilities. A recent paper by Bain presents an attack on FF3.1. However, the attacks that we show in this paper are relevant to the original FF3 and not uh, to the newer FF3.1. So FF3 accepts plaintext of a uh, domain M on N along with a key K and a tweak T and encrypts them to ciphertext in the same domain. The tweak acts as an IV value in order to allow independent encryptions of the same value. For simplicity, we will assume throughout this presentation and also throughout our paper that M is equal to N and we use N uh, to express complexity. Um, however, um, these attacks can be relatively easy gener easily generalized uh, in order to also um, uh, address cases where M is different from N. The complexity of each attack will be portray portrayed using data time and memory requirements. Note that FF3 is generally used on relatively small domains, meaning that heavy usage of time and memory is practical. Um, in that case, we will prioritize minimizing the data requirements, uh, meaning the Oracle queries, uh, at a cost of additional uh, data and, uh, sorry, at the cost of additional time and memory. So let's begin by presenting previous existing attacks against FF3. The purpose of all of these attacks is to enable encryption and decryption of any plaintext and ciphertext under a, certain, under a certain tweak. The most trivial way to do this is simply to query all possible plaintext, meaning the entire domain of n squared, and keep a table of size n squared, which holds the ciphertext of all of these uh, plaintexts. That allows us to then query the table to encrypt or decrypt any plaintext that we wish. The first attack that was an improvement over this was an attack by Dirac and Vadenay in 2017 uh, that improved the data requirements, meaning that we no longer need to query the entire domain at a significant increased time, which, although it is uh, n to the power of five, as we said earlier, these times are practical since uh, FF3 works over low domains. The second generation attack uh, by Hong, Miller, and True in 2019 uh, preserves this data and time memory requirements while significantly reducing uh, time uh, below uh, n to the power of three. We give three attacks uh, beyond these existing attacks. So the first attack is a symmetric slide. Uh, the symmetric slide attack is based on the second generation attack by Hong et al. It significantly reduces the data complexity uh, down up to uh, n to the power of 1.5, while also improving the time and memory complexities. Furthermore, it also allows a trade-off between data and time, if that is required. The second attack is an asymmetric slide. It's based on the symmetric slide and is also a further strict improvement over the symmetric slide, while also giving a better time data trade-off. The third attack is a bit different. Uh, it's an application of an attack previously shown by BM Dukelman and Keller in 2007. However, that attack was then considered impractical due to high domain sizes, since the attack requires walking over nearly the entire domain. However, um, FF3 means that this attack is now practical, since FF3 and format preserving encryptions in general have a low domain size, meaning that the attack that was previously thought to be theoretical is now practical. Note that in this attack, it is possible uh, to require more in the domain size uh, than, the, uh, than n squared, since we do need to query several different tweaks. However, we don't necessarily need to query the exact plaintext or ciphertext that we're trying to recover, meaning this attack is still better than the trivial attack. All of our contributions we experimentally verified simply by simulating them many times over random keys and tweaks. We also uh, got success rates that are strictly better than the second generation attack, uh, as can be seen in this table. On the left, uh, on the left side, you can see our asymmetric slide, uh, and on the right side, you can see uh, Hong et al's uh, second generation attack. As you can see, the number of queries and time complexity 
are uh, significantly lower, while the success rate is higher. Now that we've summarized the contributions, we can move on to show the construction uh, itself. Uh, so let's begin by the uh, cipher construction. So FF3 is an eight round Feistel construction from N on N to N on N. The thing to note here is that while most Feistel constructions use exclusive OR in order to uh, merge the left and right halves, uh, FF3 uses uh, addition modulo uh, which is what that uh, square um, notation means. That is uh, due to the fact that uh, the domain that we're working on is not necessarily a power of two, making uh, XOR uh, unfeasible. The round function uh, utilizes the tweak in order to make each round distinct. So as I said earlier, FF3 accepts two parameters, a secret key K and a tweak T. The tweak is divided into a left and right half, uh, into a left half and a right half, uh, similarly to the state. So, in order to calculate the round function of a round i, we take the corresponding tweak, meaning the right half if the round is even and the left half if the round is odd. That is exclusive ORD to the num of the round. Um, the result of that XOR is appended to the input of the function. And then all of that together is encrypted with AS uh, with key K. Then the result of that AS is truncated as necessary in order to fit the state. The important thing to note here is that um, the tweak is the thing that makes the functions of each round distinct. If the tweak is identical in two rounds, um, then the functions are also identical. So our attack has uh, three parts. First, we will create a reduction from eight round FF3 to four round FF3. Then we will break four round FF3 by reconstructing the code books of each individual round function. Uh, using a pure, uh, uh, using a subroutine that we will call pure ref reconstruction. Lastly, we'll simply combine the above two steps in order to reconstruct the codebooks of all eight rounds of FF3. In this presentation, we only have time to focus on the first round, meaning the reduction to four rounds. Therefore, the second step, we will simply assume uh, that we know the algorithm um, that we will call for the rest of the presentation PRF reconstruction. And what that does is simply accepts a number of pairs um, plain text and ciphertext pairs uh, for four round FF3 and returns the round functions. Okay, so in order to create the reduction from eight rounds to four rounds, um, we need a slide characteristic, which was presented by Dirac and Vaudenay uh, in 2017. For that slide characteristic, assume that we can encrypt under any tweak we wish. So we can abuse that scheme in order to create a slide attack. So for that, we'll need two tweaks. One tweak, uh, which is simply the tweak we are trying to attack, and the second tweak, T prime, um, which is equal, equal to the first tweak, where each half is XORed with four. Let's see how encryption under each of these tweaks uh, looks like. So if we encrypt under the original tweak, um, then simply uh, the tweak of each round is XORed with the number of the round, as we sign the definition of the round functions. However, if we look at an encryption under the related tweak, then rounds zero through four are XORed with four through seven, and rounds four through seven are XORed with zero through four. What that means is that the first half of encryption under T is equal to the second half of encryption under T prime and vice versa. If we look at it a bit differently, then we can define uh, these halves as functions F and G such that uh, encryption under T is equal to performing f and then g, and encryption under t prime is equal to performing g and then f, where note that both f and g, they are each f of three with four rounds. So using this, we can mount a slide attack on f of three, where the purpose of the slide attack is to find input output pairs for f and for g. In order to do so, uh, we will need something called slid chains, which was presented by Furoya in 2002. Slid chains are iterative uh, encryptions, meaning we choose a random starting point, x0, and iteratively encrypt it in order to create a chain. Um, so here we can see encryption under uh, t. We can also do the same thing for the related tweak from a random starting point, y0. Um, note that the functions that uh, the chains are both alternating functions of f and g. However, we only know, um, we do not know the intermediate states between f and g. Now note what happens 
if there exists some offset t for which fx0 is equal to yt, as shown here. In that case, we can align the chains at an offset of uh, four rounds to each other. Uh, and we can see that since the functions of g and f are now simply the same in each chain, that means that from here, here on forward and also backwards, the values in both chains are identical, meaning that the intermediate values of each chain are the values held in the other chain. That gives us, on one hand, uh, a lot of values for f, since f of x0 is yt, fx1 is yt plus 1, and so forth. On the other hand, that also gives us values for g, since gyt is x1, gyt plus 1 is x2, and so forth. Meaning that if we can locate two chains and an offset where we can find a single node where the intermediate value is equal to the value of the other chain, we now have plaintext ciphertext pairs for f and for g, which then allow us to mount the four-round PRF reconstruction. So our goal is now to find such chains uh, which we call slid chains for a correct offset. The problem with identifying slid chains is that it's difficult to do so without knowing the intermediate values, since we do not know the encryption uh, after four rounds of FF3. The naive solution is to not try to figure out um, what chains are slid or not. That means that for every single possible offset between two chains, we simply try PRF reconstruction on that offset. If the reconstruction works, um, that means that we have succeeded. We have queried on a successful slide, uh, and we're finished. If it doesn't work, we can move on to the next slide. The problem with that is that th this is very expensive in time. PRF reconstruction takes about uh, n to the power of 1.5 time uh, for each query, meaning that if we try to query it for each offset, um, then we need to do the full process of PRF reconstruction a lot of times, when ideally we will only do it for a correct offset. Therefore, we can try to use a distinguisher, which was what Hoang et al. did. If we have a distinguisher for 4 and FF3, then we can query each offset and only call PRF reconstruction on the correct offsets. That is, since if the chains are slid with offset D, then the intermediate values uh, form plain text cipher text pairs for 4 and FF3. Therefore, a distinguisher will return true for those values. However, if the chains are not slid chains under a certain offset, then the values are simply not correlated between the two chains. Therefore, a distinguisher will return false. That means that if we can find a distinguisher that performs better than PRF reconstruction, then we can improve the attack. So, Huang et al. used the distinguisher that required uh, n to the power of uh, 1.5 pairs of plaintext, uh, where each pair has a common right half. We used the same distinguisher that Huang et al. used. However, uh, we did improved analysis that showed that it only required O tilde of n pairs. Um, we can simulate such O tilde of n pairs by accepting only square root of n plaintext, where all of those plaintexts have a common right half. Therefore, defining all pairs between uh, each two of those plaintexts, we can create O tilde of n pairs. Since the distinguisher can work in time uh, equal to the data that it accepts, we now have a distinguisher that works with square root of n data and square root of n time. Uh, sadly, the exact workings of this distinguisher are outside the scope of this presentation. However, if you are interested, they are presented uh, in the paper. Um, for this presentation, we will use this distinguisher as a black box. Um, only note that it does require square root of n plaintext that all have a common right half. So using this distinguisher and the slid chains, we can now set up our attacks. So all three of our attacks um, use similar premises of creating chains and trying to find slides between them. However, uh, we only have time to present one of those attacks. So uh, we've chosen to present the cycle detection slide, the third attack, because we believe uh, it is the most interesting. Um, so how does the cy cycle structure attack work? So FF3 is a permutation, meaning that its graph is formed of cycles. This structure can be used to find uh, slid chains more easily. Um, and that is, as I said earlier, a theoretical attack presented by BM Dunkelman and Keller in 2007. Um, however, as I said in the beginning of the presentation, 
before now, this uh, attack was purely theoretical. Since it requires on walking over most of the domain of any certain cipher, therefore it was impractical for any cipher with a large domain. Due to format preserving encryptions uh, having low domains, that means that this attack is now practical for FF3, which gives it additional academic value. So let's see how this attack works. Consider a cyclic change, uh, sorry, consider a cyclic chain uh, of size L in the permutation graph defined by the tweak T. Now consider the intermediate value, meaning that if we look at the chain uh, x0, x1, x2, then now we have the intermediate values, y0, y1, y2, and so forth. Now consider the cycle defined by those intermediate values. That cycle has two traits that we want. The first trait is that its length is exactly equal to the length of the original cycle. The second is that um, as, uh, because it is formed of the intermediate values, because of the slide characteristic of alternating forms of G and on F, that means that that cycle is a cycle in the permutation graph of the related tweak, meaning the tweak where each half of the tweak is XORed with four. Since those two cycles are intermediate, hold the intermediate values of each other, that means that if we can find those two cycles, the first in the graph uh, of the original tweak, and the second in the graph of the related tweak, then under a certain offset, those two cycles form slid chains. And then we can use them in order to recover F and G. So in order for that, we need to find a cycle of sufficiently, uh, a cycle of sufficient length in T, and then find a cycle of the exact same length in T prime. So let's see how long our cycles need to be. So as we said earlier, the distinguisher needs a square root of n plaintext with a common right half in order to work. That means that the minimum length of the cycles needs to be n to the power of 1.5 in order for there to guarantee uh, a specific right half um, where all of, uh, uh, in order to guarantee a specific right half that has square root of n plaintext that all have that common right half. According to Shep and Lloyd uh, from 1966, there is a high probability that a cycle of sufficient length exists. And not only that, there is a high probability that a cycle of that exact length is unique in the permutation graph of the encryption. That means that if we can find two cycles um, that have the exact same length, one in t and one in t prime, with a very high probability, they aren't just random cycles that have the same length, they are the exact offset cycles of intermediate values that we need. Meaning that it's not a, meaning that it's simply sufficient to find the cycle of the exact same length in the related tweak graph. The problem of finding a cycle of a specific length is that it's costly in data. In order to do that, you need to walk over uh, most uh, of the encryption graph of the related tweak. And therefore, that uh, takes n squared data and uh, also n squared time and memory in order to do so. Now, once we have found uh, those two cycles, then we can now test all offsets between the two cycles, meaning that we look at all plain text defined uh, by all the offsets. Um, for example, starting by x0 aligned with y0, then y1, then y2, and so forth. If a specific offset is accepted by the distinguisher, we can then use those values in order to recover f and g, and thus, thus recover the full eight rounds of FF3. So to go over the full alg algorithm start to finish, First, we find an input cycle of sufficient length in the original graph. Then we find an output cycle, meaning a cycle of the exact same length um, under the related uh, tweak. Then we find all of the values in the input cycle that we need for the distinguisher, meaning we find the most common right-hand value and keep uh, square root of n indices uh, where it appears. And those will be the plain text that our distinguisher requires. Then we go over all possible offsets. Uh, there will be n to the power of 1.5 of them and test each and every one using the distinguisher. If the distinguisher accepts a slide and because of the, uh, the structure of the cycles, there is a, a very high probability that it will accept one of the slides. We assume that that slide is the correct one. And then we can call PRF reconstruction on F and on G. Let's do some complexity analysis. The time requirement. Um, there are n to the power of 1.5 offsets, and the distinguisher requires square root of n time to run. Therefore, the time of checking all of the offsets uh, is O tilde of n squared. Uh, 
which is also the time needed to find uh, the two cycles. And as we saw earlier, the most heavy data requirement is all of the queries required to find the cycles, um, which is n squared. And that concludes our attack. Now, beyond these three attacks uh, that we have, uh, we have some further more minor contributions, uh, which I will list here. The first is that we managed to improve the time complexity of that PRF reconstruction um, from n to the power of five thirds, which was what uh, which was what was used by Huang et al. We improved that to n to the power of three halves. We also had added two related domain attacks, which related domain attacks mean that we query under separate domains in order to reconstruct um, the encryption. The first is a generic attack on all cycle walking uh, format preserving encryption schemes. And the section is a distinguishing attack, which is relevant for FF3 and also for FF31, um, where, which are, origin, which are uh, three attacks that we presented here, uh, don't work on FF31, since they fix, um, uh, the, alter, uh, they fix uh, the slide characteristic slide characteristic that was dependent on uh, the tweaks. We also have some several additional minor results, um, including um, reduction of memory and some alternate attack models. To conclude what we've done here, uh, we presented three new attacks on FF3, um, where the symmetric and the asymmetric attacks significantly reduced the data complexity of previous attacks, while also improving time and data memory and also allowing uh, time data uh, sorry, while also improving time and memory complexity and also allowing a time data trade-off as needed. We also uh, showed uh, a new attack, which is a practical application of a previously theoretical attack. These findings show the general potency of slide attacks and why it's important uh, to make RAND functions different from one another. And it also shows how interesting theoretical results may become practical in the future. Thank you for watching. <laughs>